comes within a 10 year period. So as you can see here, we also think about the domain Eukarya as being comprised of four different kingdoms. As a reminder, Animalia, Fungi, Plantae, and Protista. And so today's topic is to dwell a little bit further into the kingdom Protista. So once again, make sure you're aware of the domain Eukarya, kingdom Protista, and Protus. When we think about Protus, there's a great deal of diversity across this kingdom, many habitats that they're in, you can find them in on campus, in various different places, in freshwater and saltwater habitats, and high mountain lakes, in various different parts of terrestrial habitats as well. So a very diverse group that was in a way problematic for biologists to kind of categorize into a kingdom or a single kingdom for many, many years. And it's still hotly contested and debated and many biologists go back and forth in terms of how to classify them, but they are very diverse. And so we're going to dwell a little bit into that today. So they are classified in the main eukarya and kingdom protista, and I encourage you to watch all the videos that we posted on Canvas. Now, when we think about their morphology, here are some common examples of what the morphology might look like. Most of them are actually unicellular, but not all of them. So not all of them are unicellular, but most of them are. Many have a high level of structural and functional complexity, so they're a very diverse group. They're also diverse morphologically or very different morphologically in terms of where you find them. And so they can range anywhere from amoeboids and ciliates that possess unique organelles. And we normally we'd be looking at these under the microscope. You can see a lot of really good footage that we posted to um, look at them under the microscope as well. And so very diverse morphologies. Now, a little bit about the general biology of protists. Once again, they are eukaryotes in the domain eukarya in the kingdom protista. So they do have membrane and closed organelles and a nucleus. Now, talking a little bit about their life cycles, most of them are actually free living. That is, they're suspended and able to move about in their environment. Some are actually are parasitic. And so some are actually common parasites. So we'll go over that as well in lab and lecture. Now, asexual reproduction is common within the kingdom protista or among protists, but we do have examples of when certain conditions deteriorate or examples of sexual reproduction that occurs in protista. So we will gather into this more when we think about the benefits, the pros and cons the, of asexual versus sexual reproduction. We'll talk a little bit more about that, the opposing sides when we get into other kingdoms, but just kind of to plant that seed a little bit, there are some advantages and disadvantages to being an asexually reproducing organism versus a sexually reproducing organism. But we'll kind of hit more of that when we start talking about animalia. So just to kind of think about that. Now, some life cycles are simple. Many have extremely complex life cycles. And also when we think about protists in terms of their size, they vary in size anywhere from microscopic algae to protozoans to kelp more than 200 feet in length. So there is not only a huge diversity in terms of life cycles and strategies, in terms of sexual reproduction versus asexual reproduction, habitats they're found in, but also in terms of their size overall. So very different um, size ranges within the kingdom protista. Now we're focusing a little bit on the ecology of protists and the kingdom protista. Protists are of enormous ecological importance. So many of them include photoautotrophic forms that produce oxygen. So these are producers of oxygen in freshwater and saltwater. And so many of you have probably have learned or heard that, you know, plants are important because photosynthesis, they produce oxygen, et cetera. But actually diatoms and dinoflagellates in oceans actually contribute a greater extent or more to atmospheric oxygen over time. So kind of important, even more so than plants in many cases in terms of their ecological importance. But they do produce oxygen, many of them. They are also a major component of planktonic ecological systems in a lot of environments such as the ocean. So these organisms, keep in mind, are suspended in water. So they also provide food for other heterotrophic protists and also other kinds of animals. Now many of protists are actually symbionts, and what that means is they have a symbiotic association with another organismal group. And we'll get more into those as we progress through some of these different taxonomic groups. These uh, symbiotic associations can range anywhere from strictly parasitism to also mutually beneficial partnerships that they have with other organisms. And we're gonna get into that more as we go through some of these taxa. They're also greatly 
important in terms of coral reefs, which are aided by the symbiotic association of autotrophic protists in the tissues of corals. So there's this interesting symbiotic association that goes on with corals, and we'll hit upon that when we talk about corals and animal diversity. Very important symbiotic association between protists and animalia. And then also, they're also a component of lichens. So lichens are broken into two different kinds of categories. And so one of them is a symbiotic association with green algae. So we'll hit upon that further as we go through our next organism groups. So thinking a little bit about the evolution of protists as a group, they great, have a great deal of complexity and diversity among protists that makes them very difficult to classify. As I mentioned, this is an emerging issue. This has been a problem for biologists to kind of figure out where do we place these unique organisms in what category. And so they are in the kingdom Protista, the domain eukarya, but for a long time, they were thought of as some being animal-like, some being plant-like, some exhibiting traits of other organismal groups. And so they were kind of very difficult and still are to some cases, hard to classify. And so they cannot be classified as plants because the gametes and zygotes are not protected from drying out. They really can't be classified as fungi because they do not have chitin or chitin in their cell wall. And they cannot be classified as animals. They do not undergo embryonic development. So there's really sort of been a very long standing where do we place these unique organisms? And typically we think of them as being some plant like, some animal like, and some have tendencies of other ones. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But in general, when we think about eukarya as in these different kingdoms that we're going to go over, or at least some of which in this class, they're now thought to be placed in a couple supergroups. So I'll just mention a little bit briefly so you have a greater understanding in terms of context of how difficult it is to place these in a certain category. This shows an outline of eukaryotic supergroups. And so within eukarya, in terms of just this diagram, thinking about a very sort of simple phylogeny, there's a lot of issues that go on in terms of classifying them into these supergroups. So the dotted lines here on the left suggest that there's some kind of evolutionary relationship that remains under debate, so it's still kind of not known. Just two, three, two or three things to point out within this um, figure here. And we'll have an article assignment on this in class where we have cherophytes or a certain kind of protists and land plants being a sister taxon. So remember, we learned about phylogenies. If you focus in on this part of the figure, you can see cherophytes, their green algae being sister sister attacks our sister group to land plants. And so we'll have an article where we talk about the evolution of early plants. Also, just to highlight here at the bottom, we have this group of fungi more closely related to animals and plants. And then also lastly, when we think about protists or specifically guanaflagellates and animals are a sister taxon. So we'll also talk about that in terms of the evolution of the first animals. And so just kind of outlining overall the eukaryotic supergroups to kind of help us understand that for many years, these were very difficult to classify, but we'll kind of delve into that as we get into each of the kingdoms and we'll talk a little bit about these and bring these topics back up. So protists are primarily classified according to how they obtain nutrition. So how do they move about in their environment? Also, how do they obtain food or nutrition? And so we think about protists as being primarily animal-like, and so animal-like we refer to as heterotroph or heterotrophic organisms. So animal-like in terms of that they eat other organisms, such as the didinium up here eating a paramecium. So that's one protist eating another protist. Or we might think of them as being more plant-like. And so when we think about plant-like protists, we call those or classify those as what is called autotroph or autotrophic. And so they actually contain chloroplasts and make their own food via photosynthesis. So they're green in many cases. So actually very similar in plants, hence the term plant-like, we're going to call that term autotrophic, the ability to produce their own food. We also categorize them as being fungal-like or fungus-like, and these are oftentimes thought of in terms of their ecological roles. So they might be decomposers, but they are a unique form of heterotroph, such as the water mold, saprolegnia. So if you ever rear a tank of fish, saprolegnia or water mold is an issue um, in terms of rearing fish and can be a problem if you're rearing any kind of aquarium or tank. And lastly, the category is basically a little bit of a mix of both plant and animal-like. And so we'll dwell into this further in lab in the sense of some protists have characteristics of both animal and also plant-like organisms. So depending upon the right environment, they might be able to produce food on the top of the surface. However, in different environments where it's dark, they might have to actually consume other organisms. So they're a little bit of plant-like, a little bit of animal-like. And we call those or assign them this category mixotrophic. So we'll have some examples of those, such as euglena, we'll go over in lab. But just thinking overall in terms of how protists are classified according to 
how they obtain food or nutrition. And there shows you Glina, an example of a mixotrophic animal and plant-like protist. So thinking also a little bit further in terms of transportation, how they move, so not only how do the protists obtain food, but also how do they move about in their environment. So you can think about this as, let's say, an aquatic environment or viewed under the microscope. How much you view these protists, how might they move about in their environment? Well, there's three general categories or three general methods by which protists tend to um, move around their environment. The first one there being an example of paramecium that has what are called cilia. So these very fine hair-like appendages that actually enable them to move and feed. And so you can imagine cilia helping this paramecium move. And so they also have paramecium as oral groove, which is sort of a primitive mouth. And it's kind of interesting to think about here with this little high quality video here showing that cilia on a, on a slide. Imagine this sort of in a 3D environment. So those fine hair-like appendages called cilia enable paramecium to move. These are quite large, very common. So if you take a little bit of pond water, you're probably more than likely to find some paramecium under the microscope. Now, we also move towards amoeba, which tend to use a cytoplasmic streaming pseudopodia, or what's called false foot, that extends and their cytoplasm flows around it, and they use this to engulf food. They use it to move, but they also use it to kind of engulf food in a process called phagocytosis. And so this shows a microscopic view of a typical amoeba. Also, another very common protist you might see in freshwater areas. We have found this out at the lake before. We've taken lake water and looked at it under the microscope. But you can kind of look here and look at that amoeba kind of using that cytoplasm streaming, and they actually use that what's called a false foot or pseudopodia. So kind of important in terms of how they might move about in their environment. And they actually will extend that cytoplasm to engulf food in terms of how they not only move, but how they also feed and obtain nutrition. And then lastly, the example on the right there with C. euglena, is an example of a mixotrophic, so it's animal-like and plant-like, and it uses what's called to move a flagella or a whip-like tail for movement. And so this is an illustration showing that in terms of Euglena being able to move via this long whip-like tail uh, called a flagella. And so we have just in summary here, how do protists move in their environment? What enables them to move about? Let's say under the microscope, if you're viewing them, you have those fine hair-like appendages, cilia as in paramecium. You have amoeba, which kind of stretch out with that cytoplasmic uh, streaming to allow them to engulf food as well, or that false food called a false foot, sorry, called a pseudopod. And then lastly, we have euglena, which uses a whip-like tail called a flagellum. So kind of just three mechanisms by which protists are able to move about in their environment that in many ways relates to then obtaining food as well. So when we think about protists, we also think about their ecological role, but we might also think about how they might function as parasites of humans. And so from that perspective, we might care about protists in terms of whether they can be parasites of humans or how they relate to human health. One common example, or the more famous example might be what's called trypanosoma. So this is actually an example of a parasitic protozoan that's actually implicated and causes African sleeping sickness. So there's the problem, you can see that protist there, that parasite invading the blood barrier, and those are kind of blood cells there. So kind of important parasite from a human health perspective. Another example, when most of us think about malaria, let's say, and we think about that being a problem in certain countries of the world, still an issue and a problem that kills a lot of people. So we might want to care about malaria, but we need to know a little bit about the life cycle and biology of the disease. So malaria is spread by mosquitoes. However, what's actually going on in terms of malaria, those mosquitoes have a parasite or plasmodium or prunus. So that's what that figure is showing there. So most of us focus on not only be the vector, but the mosquito, but what's actually going on there is this protozoan parasite. It's actually um, involved, implicated in that disease. So kind of important from a human health perspective in terms of malaria. And lastly, we have what's called beaver fever or more commonly referred to as giardia. This is actually an intestinal parasite that you can see in contaminated water. So if you're hiking in the mountains and you see a clear lake, I wouldn't necessarily drink the water because it actually might be contaminated with what's called giardia, this uh, one parasite or protozoan parasite. So it can be found in high mountain lakes, even though they look very clean. I wouldn't recommend that you go and drink lake water because you might get beaver fever. So just thinking about the importance of protists as they relate to human health in terms of many of them being examples of parasites. Now there's an old film, actually the inspiration for which was a parasitic protozoan 
And so this old film from the 60s called The Birds was actually inspired by an event that happened a few years prior in California where disoriented seabirds flew into buildings in California. And these birds actually consume a toxic acid produced by the pseudo-initia diatom. So this planktonic algal protist actually caused a change in the bird behavior. Actually, that story is sort of interesting because it led to this sort of classic Alfred Hitchcock film, The Birds. But it's based on a, or has a biological basis of a protozoan parasite. So kind of interesting to think about, not just for the human health example of parasites and diseases, but also inspiring modern culture. Now a little bit more about the importance of protists from an ecological perspective. Um, we think of protists as very important for food webs and food chains. So they're an important food source for other organisms. Not only that, we think about something called the red tide. We oftentimes see, based on certain uh, climatic conditions and the environment, these algal blooms occurring in areas off the coast of different places around the world. What's called a red tide, this is actually an algal bloom. It can actually be uh, implicated in a lot of fish die off. So what will happen is all the oxygen is consumed right off the coast there, and then you'll have fish essentially dying off. And so that's called a red tide. This is actually an example of an algal bloom. We also think about, in terms of the ecological world of protists, as I mentioned, diatoms and dinoflagellates actually produce or are more responsible for producing more oxygen in the atmosphere than, let's say, uh, terrestrial plants for that matter. And so they're almost more important in terms of producing oxygen, but they're also important producers in aquatic habitat. So not just for humans or in terms of atmospheric oxygen, but many photosynthetic protists are very key members of aquatic habitats in terms of their food chain and their role of being able to uh, be producers in those food chains and food webs. And we'll talk more about food webs and food chains as we get into ecology later in the semester. Also mentioned many ecological relationships of protists. They're involved in symbiotic association with other organisms. One example to highlight briefly here is what actually occurs in termites. So in terms of maybe not beneficial to your home if you have an infestation, but out there in, let's say, the Wingate Lake area, if you look at a log and that log being decomposed over time, Termites, you might find that log. So actually, they're beneficial in the sense that there's a protozoan that actually lives in the gut of the termite that allows them to basically break down wood or consume wood. So kind of an important ecological role in terms of inside the gut of the termite, there's a protozoan that helps them break down organic matter. So kind of interesting in terms of the various different ecological roles of many different protists. So a little more on the importance of protists, thinking about them just from, let's say, a financial perspective, actually, or monetary perspective. Protists were actually involved in the Great Potato Famine in Ireland, where over a million people starved, was also called the Potato Blight, and they grew on the potatoes, pictured there on the bottom right. Also, in terms of the um, pet trade or aquarium, if you ever try to rear an aquarium, you know you can get spikes of bacteria, but also spikes of something called water mold. It's actually a saprolegnia. A protist, a protist. So it's a decomposer in the natural environment of, let's say, when the fish dies, sinks to the bottom of the lake. Saprolegnia or water mold can actually um, help break it down, but it's an issue if you're trying to rear fish for, let's say, salmon being released out in the Pacific Northwest or even in Western North Carolina for hatcheries or just for the pet trade itself. And so kind of interesting in terms of financial perspectives that they could be a problematic issue these various different protists. Now, in terms of their evolutionary relationships, protists and protista, the kingdom, now we'll talk more about plants being descended from a specific kind of protist called green algae. We'll have an article we read about that, so they're important from an evolutionary perspective. And also when we think about many of the geological things we've discussed thus far in the class in terms of the geological errors, the mass extinction, when we look at fossils, we can actually use one particular protist or four amines in marine sediments with an extensive fossil record that are used to actually look at historical ocean temperatures because we know that many of these foramens were basically only able to live in certain temperatures. We can kind of go back and backtrack and look at, well, it's possible that the ocean was around this temperature by finding those fossils in the same areas that we find or same deposits we might find certain fish. So we can kind of piece together some of those clues to think about ocean temperatures from a historical geological perspective by just finding these marine sediments or foramens. So kind of interesting from an evolutionary perspective, the role of many different protists. 
Now, one category of protista or the diversity of protists involves algae. So algae refers to many protists that carry out photosynthesis. So they're plant-like in that sense. They inhabit a wide variety of environments and habitats, such as oceans, even snow under the ice, tree barks, turtles' backs even. You can find algae on turtles' backs out of Wingate Lake, for example, and various different freshwater habitats as well. Many of these algae are also symbiotics or symbiotes with fungi, plants, and animals, so they have many different relationships with other organisms, even as diverse as, let's say, the eggs of a salamander. You can find certain kind of algae as well. They're an important food source in oceans. We'll go over that as well. And actually, certain groups of algae are used to make sushi, ice cream, plastics, paint, agar. A number of different products are actually derived from different kinds of algae, a kind of protist. So kind of interesting to think about just talking a little bit about algae in terms of the kingdom of protista. Now, most algae are actually unicellular, so most of them are unicellular, but some are filamentous or colonial, so some live in groups. Some also are multicellular, so they resemble kind of leaves of lettuce. And so algae are diverse in terms of the kinds of algae, and we'll kind of talk about dividing these into green algae, red algae, brown algae, but they're kind of an interesting group of protists. So we think about algae, multicellular algae, in terms of the kingdom protista as being divided by either red algae, green algae, or brown algae. So let's just kind of highlight some of these examples of different types of algae. So highlighting green algae, so plants are thought to be derived from green algae or a certain group called cherophytes because both groups are both cherophytes, green algae, and plants possess similar traits. Those traits including a cell wall that contains cellulose. Also, both can possess chlorophylls A and B. And lastly, both green algae or cherophytes and plants are able to store excess food as starch. And so kind of an important three lists here, three, three lines that actually talk about how plants and algae, green algae specifically are very similar. And so we'll have an article that we read about for Cherophyta, that plant ancestor that helps us understand as plants evolved in aquatic environments and then move terrestrial. We'll look at some of the similarities between modern day plants and actually green algae. Because when you think about the evolutionary relationships with a certain kind of green algae cherophytes, a certain group, this taxonomic grouping within green algae, within Protista, there's many similarities that they share with plants. Hence, they get that name plant-like, but we think about their evolution, it's kind of important to kind of Look at these two groups closely. So we'll have an article that we kind of go over uh, this week for that. Now this shows you an example of a chloroplast since we're talking about cherophytes, we're talking about green algae. And so just to show you sort of a picture here, this cross section of the inner membrane, those stacks of thycoloid membranes, granite and stoma here. But just kind of thinking about a micrograph there of a Lodi on the right as well, to kind of highlight this home that many Cherophytes that plant like green algae have very many similarities to modern day plants, one being chloroplast. So just an idea of what that might look like. And we will also explore this further once we start talking about plants and the evolution of plants. Some other photos of typical algae. So on the left there you see red algae, on the right you see green algae. So they, they share many similar DNA sequences with photosynthetic cyanobacteria. And scientists actually have speculated that in a process called endosymbiosis, an ancestral prokaryote actually engulfed a photosynthetic cyanobacterium that helped evolve into modern day chloroplasts. So we'll hint a little bit about one of the videos that we'll show in Canvas this week, this endosymbiosis theory. And so this is kind of an interesting way to think about the evolution of different groups of algae and the evolution of chloroplasts within algae and hence plants. Now, another example of a green algae that forms colonies, forms clusters of these large circles, is what's called volvox. And so we'll have a lab where we actually look at volvox. This is a colonial forming green algae that forms a loose association with independent cells. So the picture there on the right, you see kind of circles, but not only that, you see a lot of that morphology within that one larger circle. And so this is actually a colony. It's kind of this large hollow sphere where thousands of cells are arranged in a single layer around this watery interior. And each cell of a colony represents a cladmodeus cell. 
And so they actually bleat, uh, beat their flagella in a coordinated fashion. You can actually view this under the microscope, kind of watch them move around. And some spells are, cells are actually specialized for reproduction. So kind of interesting to think about other groups of green algae. Volvox, this example here that we'll focus a little bit more on in the lab, as being colonial, they form colonies. Now, talking a little bit about the diversity of protists, we actually can focus on red algae for a little bit here. Now, red algae are multicellular. There is a great number of species of red algae, over 5,000 species, and most of them actually live in warm seawater, so they're very common and diverse in sort of warmer, shallow seawater. But there are a couple things to highlight in terms of red algae, in terms of their economic importance. And so because we're in the biology department, we'll just talk about agar for a second here, where these, they form these capsules, even dental impressions, cosmetics, culture medium, electrophoresis, so a lot of things you might be exposed to, materials as you take some molecular biology or genetics. That agar, or even microbiology for that matter, that groin medium agar is very important. So from an economic importance perspective, red algae contribute a great deal. Also an ingredient called carrageenan, which is an emulsifying agent used in chocolate, low-fat foods, and cosmetics, and so some more economic importance of specifically red algae. And also we think about sushi. So those of you that like sushi, that reddish black wrappings around sushi roll is essentially a polyphora, other basically a kind of red algae. So you might not realize it, but you have sort of red algae and protist all around you in terms of products that might be maintained or derived from different kinds of red algae or protist, as well as those of you that like sushi. So focusing on one specific kind of plant like algae, large brown algae, oftentimes referred to as seaweed, We'll actually refer to it as kelp. And so kelp is one kind of protist, one kind of brown algae that's very important for many marine ecosystems. So many species that are found in these large, vast underwater kelp forests provide habitat for marine life. And so you think about just these long forms of you know, brown algae called kelp, actually you're kind of the structure for a, a diverse area, let's say off the coast of California, where we see these vast underwater areas that provide uh, an area, a habitat for a lot of marine life, including estimates have, have mentioned that they've done studies where over 100,000 invertebrates per square meter can find uh, organisms diverse as sea urchins, starfish, a lot of invertebrates, snails, worms, prawn, even octopi. So a lot can be found in the small little area within these large, vast underwater kelp forests. And we'll highlight more of these as we go through a number of different invertebrates, particularly marine invertebrates. Also fish, rockfish, sculpin, rays, even sea otters, different kinds of mammals, gray whales, sea lions. Even we think about a forest being structured from the bottom of the kelp in the underwater, but even the top. So on the surface of these kelp forests, let's say off the coast of California, there might be many different surface feeding birds, herons, gulls, cormorants. So many species kind of rely on this important link or this important kelp, this important brown algae to kind of provide the structure for this whole marine ecosystem. So if you remove the kelp, obviously that's gonna have some issues. And so we may wanna, might wanna care about how well this brown algae, this kelp is doing if we wanna conserve and protect many of those different species. So algae is also important for a number of other reasons. There's some more recent ways that we have looked at algae as being economically important. Actually, a few years ago, Exxon Mobil was looking at using the CRISPR-Cas9 genome to engineer microalgae to essentially increase the lipid content and growth rates for a biofuel and for bioenergy. And so that's one rare area where they're looking at developing different kinds of biofuel for algae and also algal biofuel still needs a lot more research and development, but it has the potential to provide uh, a great source of, of energy. Now, another kind of group or category of protists, we kind of placed this in this last category called fungal-like, even though many of them are not fungal-like, they're oftentimes referred to as fungal-like. Some examples will include slime molds. And so these actually consume food, but they do not decompose. So they're not necessarily fungal-like. They are similar to amoeba. They make spores but have no cell wall. And there's also examples of water molds that do uh, something very similar. They're kind of fungal-like. And so we have a video on slime molds. So I encourage you to watch the video that's on Canvas for this module for on protists. 
And this one kind of fungal-like protist called saprolignia, as I mentioned, that this being a problem for aquarium, if you ever grow a fish in a tank, you oftentimes get bacterial fluctuations. You might also get what's called water mold or saprolegnia. And so this is actually a kind of protist. It's sort of thought to be fungal-like because it helps to recycle dead organic material in freshwater habitats. So if a fish dies at Wingate Lake, let's say, saprolegnia will actually help recycle those organic nutrients and matter into the ecosystem of the lake. But it can be bad if you're trying to, let's say, rear fish in a tank and you have an issue with water mold. But it is actually a protist and a fungal-like protist. Some interesting things to note here about other kinds of protists. And we think about bioluminescence. So we'll go over this later in the semester when we bring up bioluminescence across different animal groups, different organisms. And so bioluminescence is actually emitted by a number of dinoflagellates and a breaking wave as seen in the New Jersey coast. So there you can actually watch video of this. There's a lot of video on dinoflagellates and bioluminescent in the ocean. And so you can actually see some of that video if you want. And they actually, this one last group here of protists that actually, many are bioluminescent, they actually exhibit a great diversity in shape. There's a great many of different dinoflagellates, um, diatoms as well. Many are encased in the cellulose-like armor, so that kind of shows you the close-up what it looks like on the top left. Many have actually uh, two flagella that fit into grooves between plates, and they actually kind of move in a very interesting spinning motion. So I just wanted to at least mention dinoflagellates, and because dinoflagellates and diatoms are responsible for a great number, a great deal of atmospheric oxygen over time on planet Earth, but also they also form this bioluminescent um, when you can see them sort of in those waves coming in. So kind of interesting thinking about protists maybe from that perspective. So one very important protist that I'm going to mention now, and this will also become important as we start learning about early animal evolution, and particularly early sponges being the early animals. One group of important protists called coanoflagellates, these are unicellular and colonial, they're actually thought to be the closest living relative to animals. And you can understand this a little greater when you look at the morphological similarities between sponges and this certain kind of protist, and you look at what these coanocytes are called collar cells. So if you look at the sponge body, which will also make more sense as we introduce sponges, they are formed of these collar cells or feeding cells called coanocytes, and they resemble morphologically, almost identically in many cases, these individual and also colonial forming coanoflagellates. And so we have an example here essentially of a, a protist that looks very similar to the feeding cells that are found in modern day sponges. And so that and a number of other DNA and molecular evidence points to coanoflagellates being a very important protist involved in the evolution of the first living animals, that being sponges. So I just want to at least introduce this idea because we'll revisit this idea of early animals and this one kind of protist. So kind of important from an evolutionary perspective. Like I said, we'll kind of reemphasize this as we introduce sponges. So to talk a little bit more about green algae from the sense or perspective of them being the common ancestor of plants. And so we'll have an article, like I said, that we'll read about green algae, a certain kind of green algae called carophytes. Once again, just to reiterate this, both this kind of green algae and green algae in general in relation to plants, both use chlorophyll. Both store excess energy or food as starch, and they have very similar DNA cell wall, and specifically green algae, the cherophytes are a very common ancestor of all land plants. So we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of land plants from freshwater or aquatic plants, and their similar morphology and reproductive strategies. So kind of interesting that they'll basically link green algae to one of our next organismal groups, plants. So a number of different take home lessons. I encourage you to go over the video for this section for protista and protist. And we will actually have a lab on protist or protista later on the semester as well. But just think about some of these learning outcomes. What is a protist? What kinds of protists are there? How do they move about their environment? How do we categorize them in terms of feeding? Are they able to produce their own food? Are they autotrophic? Are they something else? Think about their life cycle. Are they asexual or sexual producing a little bit of both? Do we have examples of how they move in terms of their flagellae, the, the pseudopodia of amoeba, let's say, or the cilia, those fine hairs? Also, why are they important ecologically? What is their lifestyle? Where are they found their life cycles? Um, are they important in terms of providing oxygen? Think about diatoms, dinoflagellates. What also 
might they be contribute in terms of medically, monetarily, economically, ecologically, evolutionarily? So there's a number of different important aspects of protist, even in terms of human health and parasitic protist. And also, what is the connection or what are some similarities between certain kind of green algae, such as pterophytes to plants? And also, how do coanoflagellates relate to animals? And we'll reemphasize that more when we talk about sponges and early animals. So with that, take some time to review learning outcomes, go through the PowerPoint. If you want, go through the series of notes, watch all the videos for this section, for this module. And with that, have a great day.